The mountain bongo primarily have been on, in three different mountain ranges in Kenya. Probably the largest two populations were in the Abadir mountain range and also in the, um, at, at Mount Kenya. The important features about Mount Kenya and the Aberdares is that these are insular mountain regions now that are separated from one another and completely surrounded by a sea of agriculture. Thankfully, they're large enough that they do function as intact ecosystems. We know that there were thousands and thousands of these bongo, but for eight or nine years, no bongo were spotted uh, at all in either one of these mountain ranges. There is a small extant bongo population on Mount Kenya today. And that's very exciting because we had no indication that there were any bongo left. Small populations suffer a terrible, terrible probability, likely probability of extinction. But they also are those last glimpses of hope for wild populations. And so it's, it's exciting to focus on them. We're all still very, very concerned. The, 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 it's, it's a critical situation, and it remains critical on both these mountain ranges. I mean, n neither of these populations are flourishing. We know that they're breeding, but we know they're not flourishing. And we know that any insult of any kind, you know, could just wipe out whatever is still left there. Now, there was a little bit of good news when this program began, and that was that we knew there was a captive group of bongo at the base of Mount Kenya that had been managed for many, many years. So there were some animals and there was a facility ready to receive animals that could be repatriated to Kenya. But the real breeding had been done in Europe and North America. So the challenge for the repatriation phase was to work out the logistics of getting animals that were three to five generations removed from the wild conditioned to go back to Kenya. And so this was done over about a two to three year period where animals were selected both for their fitness, their hardiness, their reproductive vigor, as well as their genetics, the genetic diversity. And they were quarantined at the White Oak Conservation Center in North Florida so that we had a group of good solid animals to send back to the Mount Kenya Wildlife Conservancy in Nanyuki, Kenya. To be able to watch this population of bongo grow on this end and then 30 or 40 years later to get, uh, to get the kind of uh, excitement going on the other end of the ocean and the desire to have these animals come back and uh, to be received in Kenya the way that they were received on a very, very high profile level and by all the way down to the school children just could not wait to see what a bongo looked like. You have to realize the very few school kids, high school kids, elementary school kids, middle school kids have ever seen this incredible antelope that belonged to Kenya. The population that was on the ranch at Mount Kenya Game Ranch was a population that was very, very highly inbred and certainly not what I would call a very healthy population. Once we put a couple of males uh, from the states that have been over here for all these years, uh, and we put them, infused them into that, uh, into that small group, and they began to breed the females, there was just almost an immediate, um, incredible improvement. I mean, even in the first calf crop. It is a phenomenon known as hybrid vigor. When you take an animal with just uh, the genetics are actually quite distant, and you can infuse that population, that, or the, those genetics into an inbred population. None of us envisioned that uh, degree of improvement in such a short time uh, as it happened. And no, nobody saw that coming. During my lifetime, I hope to see a viable living wild population on Mount Kenya. And whether we get there or not is going to depend largely on the steps taken right now. Because this little tiny population, subpopulation of animals, and it could be seven animals, it could be 20, we don't know yet. If we lose them, that would be a very depressing bit of news. On the other hand, if we can cling to their vitality and use them as a poster child, so to speak, for the system and what's happening, as well as the bongo program overall, then people can get excited each and every year that that population fares a little better, uh, that we see reproduction in that population and so forth. So 
It's important that bongos survive wherever they are still in the wild. But I also think that we have to continue the momentum and make sure that people who are looking at conservation programs witness the changes. To be able to watch the um, African animal keepers on the other side, to look at their eyes when they actually lifted those doors to those crates and they watched those bongo antelope come out of those crates, I'm telling you, it was just, uh, it was very inspiring. It was awe inspiring and uh, um, that was the highlight for me. I think the most powerful part of the Bongo Project is the impact that it makes at an emotional level to people. This is a gentle giant. This is a famously rare and elusive animal. People have cared about it for a long time, but it really reflects to me how we see nature today. When you look at an animal like a Bongo, which has suffered greatly at the hands of man, you have to say, gee, we, we can do better. This is an animal that uh, that represents the life-sustaining ability of the ecosystem. It is, it is the hinge for everything that happens in Mount Kenya and the Aberdares. We have to save it. It has to happen. And the project inspires hope because, yes, we can do it. We can take clear, tangible steps. They're not expensive. They're not insurmountable. These actions result in direct benefits to wildlife and to the people that need to care about them forever. These aren't transient, temporary, feel-good measures. These are true recovery steps. These are the things that will last long after all of us are gone. They will be the monuments to what we understood why we lived. And they will be the testimony to what we are as people recognizing what we've done to our planet. There is no greater message in conservation than to say we know what we need to do and we're willing to do it.